Good morning. Please be attentive to the following announcements, also on Antioch's website. CMPD, in partnership with Hickory Grove Baptist Church, are sponsoring a food giveaway from 1 to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays, June 23rd at 2348 Dr. Weber Avenue and June 30th at 801 East Arrowwood Road. No registration is required. Loaves and Fishes will host pop-up food shares from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. at Simmons YMCA on June 21st and Trinity United Methodist Church on June 25th. Registration is required. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services is sponsoring Hashtag Bringing Summer Back June 20th through 26th, for anyone 18 and older who gets their first dose of COVID-19 vaccination or drives someone else to their first dose, each will receive a $25 cash card. Visit Antioch's website for this and other vaccination events. The annual UMBA Youth Explosion will be Friday, July 23rd. Antioch is asked to donate backpacks and three-ring binders for the back-to-school event. Please drop off backpack and binder donations at the church office during office hours by Thursday, Ju July 15th. Please help represent Antioch in this outreach effort. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Antioch is having her grand reopening for in-person worship in September. Stay tuned for more important re-entry protocol information. Pastor's 24th Appreciation Celebration will take place in parking lot A on Sunday, July 11th. Also, a COVID-19 vaccination event will be included in that day from 12 to 4 p.m. at Antioch. Let's get excited and come get vaccinated. Share in an exciting book discussion, A Journey Through Grace by Reverend Reginald Tuggle on July 10th and 24th by Zoom. Follow one man's redemptive and grace-filled journey out of the grim and limiting deaths of poverty and loss. Purchase and begin reading the book. Order at www.reggietuggle.com and receive an autographed copy. Attention, ladies. Our next women's ministry activity will be Saturday, June 26th at 10 a.m. Get ready to have some fun and to experience a blessing. Send your name and email address to email at antiochfamily.org to receive the Zoom link. Please note women's ministry in the subject line. Antioch is hosting a Walking in the Harvest summer food program weekly through August 5th. Children ages 18 and younger can get breakfast and lunch at no cost from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays only. Parents, bring your kids. Kids, bring your friends. For more details and registration information, please visit Antioch's website, www.antiochfamily.org, download our church app, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Good morning, and welcome to the worship experience at the A. My name is Donnie Garris, and I am the pastor of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. We love to call the A. Thank you for choosing to join us this morning. Uh, I wish you a happy belated Juneteenth Day, uh, which was celebrated on yesterday. Uh, from now on, it will be observed as a public holiday now that both the Senate and the House of Congress voted last Tuesday and Wednesday, respectively, uh, to recognize June 19 as a federal holiday. Remembering June 19, 1865, 
the day enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, were the last to learn that slavery had ended after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had freed all enslaved African Americans two and a half years earlier. So to those of us of the African American community, uh, this is a very special occasion. Also, I want to say Happy Father's Day. Later on, as an introduction to today's sermon, I will say more about how I view uh, this observance. But right now, again, Happy Father's Day. Uh, things are a little different during the month of June and July. Uh, normally, we would broadcast from the sanctuary, uh, but we are going to use the month of June and July to broadcast from my home. So welcome to my home as we represent Antioch Missionary Baptist Church today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we observe and celebrate that this is the day that you have made Sunday and we are rejoicing and we are mighty glad to be living this day with the breath we breathe with it and for it we give you praise we celebrate in the joy of our salvation on this day we celebrate in the remembrance of our freedom on this day and we celebrate in the unique persons you have made us to be on this day. May what we experience this hour lead us to have a deeper awareness of your existence and a deeper awareness of your presence. We pray that through our songs and through our prayers and through our preached word and even in our fellowship, though we are apart, that we can still experience a greater appreciation of your love and your grace. Thank you for this day. We celebrate this day. We thank you for worship on this day, and we give you praise. It is in Jesus' name we ask it and claim it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, welcome to the A. We thank you for joining us and we pray God's blessings upon you. God bless you, and again, welcome. Come on, the Bible says in Psalms, let everything that has breath praise in the Lord. Come on, will you help us tonight? Yeah, come on. Yo. 
by the song, and now I want to invite all of us to be a blessing to God this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask that we bless the Lord in our giving. Uh, why do we give? I remind us that we give because God is good. He's the giver of all good and perfect and needed blessings in our lives to live, to survive, to thrive, and to live uh, daily life. And so we give because God is good. We give because so the church can continue to do good. We're able as a church fellowship and as a church ministry to be able to bring blessings to people in community as well as throughout the world. And so through our giving, we are able to help the church continue to do good. And we also give because it's good to give. Yes, someone said giving widens God's smile. In other words, it makes God happy. The scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. And so that's why we give. We give because God is good. We give so that the church can continue to do good. And we, begin, we give because it is good. So we invite you, tithers, if you have committed yourself to the biblical principle of giving 10% of whatever you have in the form of monetary income, we ask that you will continue to commit to your tithing pledge, as well as those who want to just give a good offering because it's good to give. We invite you to use one of three convenient options that we provide you, and that is you can give online using Antioch's church app, or you can go online using Antioch's website. Just go to www.antiochfamily.org, or you can mail your offerings, your tithe and offerings to Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, 232 Skyland Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. 
Whichever way you decide to give, we pray that you will give because it is a blessing to give. So we look forward and we thank you in advance for trusting us with your gift. And we pray God's good blessings be upon you for what you do for the Antioch Church today. God bless you and thank you. Again, happy Father's Day. And I said earlier that I will share with you now uh, how I view this observance, Father's Day. Much like I said in May about Mother's Day, that we celebrated all forms of motherhood. So today on Father's Day, I want to celebrate all forms of fatherhood, inclusive of kin and non-kin along with the men whose seed made it possible for us to be here, who not only helped birth us, but also parented us. I want to also salute and celebrate today fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, adoptive fathers, single fathers, single men, bachelors, uncles, brothers, ride and die bros, mentors, ministers, teachers, deacons, trustees, churchmen, and other positive male figures. I want to celebrate all men for their love, their teaching, their training, their time, and their talks that influence us to be the positive persons we are today. Today, we honor the many experiences and the different forms and expressions of fatherhood today. We honor all men who have shown extraordinary support, unconditional love, unselfish care for women and children. We honor all men who have modeled courage in the face of their adversities, who have modeled bravery during their difficulties, who have modeled strength while bearing their burdens, who have shown us perseverance while going through their disappointments, who have shown integrity while enduring their challenges and have maintained their dignity while dealing with unpleasant situations. So I say happy Father's Day to all men, to all men. I want to share with you the scripture text that I want to share on this Father's Day that will address all men. It comes from Genesis chapter 2, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, and I want to read a few verses out of this chapter. I want to look at verse 7 and 8, and then I want to skip down and read verses 15 through 18, and then skip again and read verses 21 through 22. Of course, I invite you to read the entire chapter, but for the sake of hearing, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. It reads in the New Revised Standard Version this way. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woe man from the rib he had taken out of the man. 
and he brought her to the man. Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and verses 15 through 18, and verses 21 through 22. On this Father's Day that we celebrate all men, I want to talk about from this text, the making of a man. Oh, you don't want to miss this. I look forward to preaching. Next, we will have a song, and after which, we will have the sermon for today, The Making of a Man. God is great. He sits high, looks down low. He's always making a way. Yeah, yeah. Our God is awesome. Oh, yes. Our God is great. He sits real high. He sits high and looks low. Mm-hmm. Keeps he on. Always making the way. Oh, yeah. Out of all the things I've done wrong, you love me and me. For all the things that you've done, Lord, I thank you for making a way. Hey, our God, our God is awesome. Yeah, yeah, our God is great. Our God is great. Yeah, oh, He sits real high. He sits high. So, oh yeah, he's always, he always making way. Oh yeah, help me sing, Marie, sing. I can always count on you, cause you never let me down. And for that reason, I'll praise you forever. From the rising of the sun. To the going down of the same I'll worship you And I'll praise you Always Oh, oh, oh. Our God is Our God is awesome. Yeah Our God is great Our God is great Lord, I thank you tonight We sit to real high We sit high
Revelations yeah. And you will bruised for my iniquities yeah. hey. And Lord, I trust you today yeah. You never let me down, you're always around The songs that were shared in this service blessed you. Songs have a way of inspiring us and lifting our spirits. And so we hope the songs have done that for you today. Again, looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and then reading verses 15 through 18 and verses 21 through 22. I want to talk about the making of a man. That's the Father's Day title today. The making of a man. What does it mean to be a man? Is being a man about roughness in sports? Is being a man about toughness on the streets? Is being a man about showing less emotions? Is being a man about suppressing one's feelings? Is being a man about not shedding any tears or pretending we have no fears? Is being a man about being how many times we insert our genitalia sowing our wild oats? or how abusively we assert our misogynistic behavior upon women. What does it mean to be a man? Crystal Jackson posted an article in August 27, 2018. She posted an article titled, Why We Need to Stop Saying Man Up. In the article, she wrote, the words we need to be using instead of man up. We should be saying grow up. Instead of saying that men should act more manly, maybe she says we should be saying that they should work on their maturity. I've always been intrigued with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, where he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood. In other words, I stopped talking like a child. I stopped thinking like a child. I stopped reasoning like a child. I matured, in other words. I grew up and grew out of some childish ways. It was Reverend Dr. Alan Waller, the author of the book, The Code of the Righteous Warrior, and I admit was a great influencer of this sermon today. He says in his book, there is a difference between being a man and being a male. Genetically, he says, all it takes to be a male is to have both an X and a Y chromosome. But sociologically, you start to become a man when you begin to take responsibility for your life, your loved ones, and the world. In other words, being a man has to do with maturity. Someone said maturity comes not with age, but with acceptance of responsibility. 
A man is being mature enough. A man is being grown enough to accept responsibility for one's life, one's life choices, one's life consequences. A man is being mature enough to accept responsibility for one's loved ones, one's family, one's friends, one community. A man is being mature enough, grown enough to accept responsibility for his world, his sphere, his circle of influence. I declare today that we see this all fleshed out in Genesis chapter 2 and what I call the making of a man. Look at this text. It's a very interesting text in Genesis chapter 2. It's from the second creation story found in Genesis 2 that I want to inspire all men on this Father's Day by looking at the making of the first man. Now, I am being gender specific, but by being gender specific, I am in no wise insinuating any superiority of the biological man over woman. See, being created first does not mean better than. But I am being gender specific for a reason. Based on this second creation story, I want to encourage us men to remember what it truly re means to be a man, what it truly means to be the God-ordained responsible man that we have for our lives, for our loved ones, and for our world. Look at the original man. Verse 7, Genesis chapter 2, says, The Lord God formed a man. The Hebrew word for man, Adam, sounds like and may be related to the Hebrew word for ground or soil, Adama. Thus, the first use of the word Adam, or Adam we call, would later be used as a name for man. Verses 20, verse 25. Chapter 3, verse 17, 20, and 21. It becomes the name used for Adam, Adam, man. The relationship of the two words, Adam and Adama, may likely be to emphasize man's relationship to the ground from which he was formed. Yahweh, Elohim, the Lord God here in chapter 2, is pictured as a potter who forms, who molds, who makes the man out of the dust of the ground. The beginnings of chapter 2, Adam, or the earth creature, was the original and all alone man. This is Adam, we find, in the early part of chapter 2 of Genesis, we find Adam before God created Eve, the first woman, before Eve comes into the picture. We can learn much about what it means to be a man when God created Adam, the first original man. I reminded that there's this interesting biblical interpretive exegetical way of studying scripture using what is called the principle of first mention, which says when you find the first occurrence of any main word, any main phrase, or any main utterance God makes mention of in his holy word, it is there that you find the truth with which that subject stands connected in the mind of God. It is there that you find the fundamental understanding that God wants you to have about that subject. So in Genesis chapter 2, we find the first occurrence of man. So what is it that God wants us to understand about 
man that is connected to the mind of God? Well, first, in the making of a man, only God made possible man's existence. That's the first thing. It says the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. We see the initial creation of man is totally possible by God. When God made this earth creature called Adam, man, God not only used something that was already in existence, but it was something that could not of itself have produced anything apart from God. It was material that had no ability to produce anything. It had no ability to grow anything. It had no ability to develop anything or evolve into anything. The Lord God made man from the dust of the ground. Oh, men today on Father's Day. The Bible says that we were formed from the dust of the ground. We were not formed from the dirt or from the soil. God did not scoop up a handful of rich American red clay. He did not scoop up good African black soil. He did not scoop up a handful of crystal European white sand. No, God took his divine finger and he swiped dirty earth and gathered up the dust of the ground to make us. The Hebrew word for dust occurs 109 times in the Old Testament, and each time dust means the fine, the loose, the dry, the small particles of earth. Dust is the residue. Dust is the leavings. Dust is the waste, the filth, the remains, the tiny bits and specks of the earth. Dust has no body and is virtually impossible to hold. It's so light that it flies and floats in the air. Dust has no properties to make anything grow. Oh, we don't plant anything in dust, nor do we expect it to grow in dust. Dust does not have enough substance to serve as a solid foundation. One of the most interesting aspects of the creation is that when God was ready to make man, God made man out of dust. God formed man. God formed us. God shaped man. God shaped us with his own hands out of the fine, the loose, the dry, the small particles of earth called dust. Somehow, I don't know how, somehow, some way, only made possible by God. God shaped man, shaped us out of the residue and waste of the earth with his own hand. Somebody said, God got his hands dusty and dirty to bring us to life. God made, God shaped, God formed man, formed us out of the dust. Men, I say, we are nothing but dust. But I say that not to devalue us nor to destroy our self-esteem, but I say that we are nothing but dust in order to humble us. We all come from the same stuff of life, dust. We all are frail, we are fragile, we are feeble, we are weak earthly beings because there is a dustiness to our human nature. We are all creatures of the dust. I like what Dr. William Watley says. 
He says, even the strongest among us, even the most handsome among us, and the smartest among us, are at our most bare and essential selves, differing configurations of dust. And that's why none of us, he says, have any business looking down our noses or assuming a position of superiority over anybody else because of differences of race, differences of culture, differences of gender, education, background, or bank account, because all we are of the same thing. Dust. <laughs> We're dusty creatures, all of us. And we are dirty creatures. I'm reminded of this story. There was a little boy who would visit his grandmother's house in the summer. One thing his grandmother did often was she would cook and invite people over for dinner. Well, one Sunday, his grandmother asked him to set the table and to get her best silverware out of her china closet. Well, like a dutiful grandson, he got the silverware. When he opened the case, he was disgusted by what he saw. The silverware was tarnished. Being young and not knowing any better, he figured that the most logical thing to do was throw the tarnished silverware away. Because he thought in his little mind that no one wanted to use something that was tarnished and looked so bad. His grandmother walked in on him and saw that he was just throwing away her silverware, her spoons, her knives, her, her forks. He was just throwing the silverware in the trash can. And all of a sudden she screamed, what in the world are you doing? His grandson told her, her grandson told her he was throwing the silverware be away because it looked like it was dirty and no good. And grandma said to her grandson, oh, baby, no, no, good silver is under all that mess. All it needs is a little polish and some rubbing and then it will be all right. <laughs> oh, man, on this Father's Day, you and I may be a little dusty, may be a little dirty, a little filthy, a little soiled. We may be tarnished, flawed, stained, damaged, but there's some good silver underneath our stuff. All some of us need is a little polishing a little teaching, a little training, a little mentoring, some counseling, some saving, some delivering, some healing, some helping. Some of us just need some grooming and some growing up and we'll be all right. Man, I have, I have an important question to ask on this Father's Day. And that is, do we know we owe our lives to God literally? Our life. It's only possible because of God. And we are dependent upon God for our very raison d'etre. In other words, our reason for being. We are dependent upon God. And though we may be a little dusty and dirty, God can help us do some polishing up. That's the first thing we need to understand about being a man. Secondly, in the making of man, God breathed power into man's nostril to bring him to life. Adam, the earth, dust creature, is animated by the Lord God's breath or spirit, which empowers and enables him to become a living being. Into this dusty model, the text shows us, God blew God's very breath, God's very spirit, God's very life. He blew that into this lifeless dust and made this lifeless dust a living soul. 
By breathing into this living soul, he made it a living being, a living creature, a living organism. What was just a lifeless pile of dust? God, by God's breath, by God's spirit, made it alive, made it a living being with his own breath of life. God blew into the man's nostrils the spirit of life, which gave him the power to live. And man became a living being. So I say, man, men, we literally owe life, our very lives, to God. It was Dr. Kevin Cosby who wrote a book called, Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> In this book, he said, the book of Genesis teaches us that it is not until God breathes into our nostrils, the breath of life, that we become living souls. We have no life apart from the breath of God. Our relationship, says Dr. Cosby, our relationship with God is inextricable. Our relationship with God is a given before we are even aware of it. God gives us life and God gives us God's breath. Binding us in relationship to God from the day we are born until the day our breath is called back to God. Dr. Cosby says the quality of our life depends on our relationship with God. Either we cultivate that relationship for the good or we neglect it to our detriment. Story about a Sunday morning worship service. At this time of the sermon, the pastor came before the people and um, he wanted to illustrate his sermon point for the day. So what he did, he spread some dirt on the church nice white carpet. He just went sprinkling dirt all around on the white carpet around the pulpit. And you can imagine the gasp and the shock and surprise. He then brought out a vacuum cleaner and he asked the congregation, how many of you believe that this vacuum cleaner is capable of cleaning up this dirt? Everyone raised their hands the pastor said, well, now let me show why you're all wrong this morning. He then pushed the vacuum cleaner over the dirt and absolutely nothing happened. He asked the congregation, why isn't the vacuum cleaner doing its job? And one bright member shouted from the back row of the sanctuary, because it's not plugged in. And the pastor said exactly. Without us being plugged in to God's power, we too are powerless. Men, can I ask us another question on this Father's Day? What is the state of our relationship with our power source God for life. Do we know that without God and God's spirit surging through us, that we are powerless? Do we know that the quality of our life depends on our relationship with God? Do we know that we cannot be right, we cannot think right, we cannot live right, we cannot feel right, we cannot do right, we cannot choose right, we cannot relate right, we cannot function right. Do we know that all our potential and possibility for anything right and righteous is because of God's spirit living in us? When God blew into man the breath of life, God's spirit gave man 
personality, intellectuality, emotionality, rationality, morality, volitionality, spirituality, relationality, functionality, and all sorts of potentiality. God gives us enough power. God gives us enough potential and possibility to be who we are and to carry out our lives. Thirdly, in the making of man, God gave man a place within which to fulfill his destiny. Notice what it says. It says, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. Men. There is something that you and I uniquely have been put on earth to do. We all were made with a purpose and put on this earth. Every man has a unique assignment and an ability that we and only we can fulfill on earth. There is a higher plan for our life. There's a spiritual assignment much bigger than us that we are perfect to do because we were born to accomplish it. In other words, God has given each of us a destiny. Again, quoting Dr. Alan Waller, he said, destiny acknowledges the existence of a higher power and a higher plan for your life. Destiny acknowledges that there is a spiritual assignment much bigger than you but that you are perfect for because you were born to accomplish it. As the old saying goes, destiny means what God has for me is for me. Your destiny, says Dr. Waller, is for you and you alone. It is a full employment opportunity that you can dedicate your life to. Men, our life is not an accident. Our existence is not happenstance. God brought us into existence for a purpose with an assignment that is our full life employment opportunity. We have the spiritual gift we are endowed with some remarkable skills. We have the natural ability to do what God has put us on earth to do. It's, it's in accord with our passion. It's that which excites us and inspires us to get up in the mornings. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our current condition, regardless of our situation, we are in the right context to still get it done because it is our purpose. It is our destiny. It is God's plan and our ability to do it. We are destined to do it. Men, I have another question to ask. Do we know what we're made of and what we're made for? Do we know what we are put on planet Earth to do? Are we working our gifts? Are we working our skills? Are we working our abilities right in the context we find ourselves? I know it may not be the best situation, but God has given us a conquering ability to overcome our circumstances and still fulfill what God wants us to do and to be all that God wants us to be. How many of us have ever tuned in to Erica Campbell's Get Up Morning Show? Comes on the radio five days a week. 
if you are familiar with Erica Campbell's Get Up Morning radio show, you know that she has a comedic sidekick whose name is Griff. Griff shared an interesting story on one of the programs one day. He said that when he was a child, every morning before leaving the house for school, his mother would tell him and his siblings to do something. She would say to Griff and his siblings, I want you to look at your thumb and repeat after me. I am thumb body. <laughs> he said she did this, had them to look at their thumbs and repeat after her, I am thumb body. She did this to remind them that like the uniqueness of their thumbprint, there's nobody else in the whole wide world who's created like them to be who they are and to do what God has assigned them to do. Men, are we aware that God has made us somebody? <laughs> There's nobody who can do what we do and be who we are. Fourthly, in the making of man, God assigned work for his life. Look at it. Yeah, it's right there. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Work belongs to the garden. Work is good to enhance the garden. God entrusts the garden to the man to work it. The man is to care for and tend to the garden. He is to till it. He is to keep it. He is to nourish it. He is to nurture it. Man is given a vocation and he is expected to share in God's work in keeping what God has created. Again, Dr. Waller says, we live in a world where people chase success. There's nothing wrong with success, but there is a higher pursuit in life and it's called significance. When you are significant, you leave an imprint in the world that lives far beyond you. He says there are many successful people who died and left no significant impact beyond the scope of their personal success. Success. Dr. Cornell West, the great social critic, said, I think think success is worldly in terms of the American dream and is often characterized as pecuniary gain and financial prosperity, economic status, living in the big vanilla suburb, living large and the bling bling that goes along with it. Success, he defines. For a moment, think about people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Or think about people or men like Malcolm S., John Lewis, Hank Aaron, Jackie Robinson, John Thompson, David Dinkins, and the list goes on. Think about such people, such men. They weren't successful in terms of accumulated material or monetary riches and wealth. Uh-uh. They, they, they weren't successful in the world's terms of living large and the bling bling that goes along with it. No, when you look at their lives, they weren't successful in terms of the kind of neighborhood they came from or the side of town they lived in, but they are famously known because they lived lives that left a significant impact and imprint in the world. They were known for the quality of their service, their genuine love for all humanity, their willingness to lay down their lives for the betterment of us all. 
Men, I have another question on this Father's Day. What significant impact are we making in the world? What footprints in the world and what imprint on the lives of others are we making? What service, what love, what sacrifice in our communities are we making for the betterment of others? What is our life work that will make a difference in the context we find ourselves? Fifthly, in the making of man. What we learned today is God commanded specific parameters to live his life. Yeah, look at it. He said, the Lord God commanded the man. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Notice that there is, first of all, a permit. The Lord God permitted, commanded the man. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Part of the permission was the tree of life, which refers to that which enhances and that produces and creates life. It's related to righteousness or the right way of life. But there was one tree that was prohibited, the tree of knowledge in verse 17. Nothing is more explained or said about this tree, only that it is the prohibited tree. For those inquiring minds who want to know why God would command prohibition on this one particular tree. What well, I like what the Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann simply put it. He said, while it is true that this is the prohibited tree, nothing is made of that. For the purpose of the story, there is one tree, the tree of command. The story is not interested in the character of the tree, the trees are incidental to the main point that God's command is a serious one. What counts is the fact of the prohibition, the authority of the one who speaks and the unqualified expectation of obedience. Walter Brueggemann says the destiny of the human creation is to live in God's world with God's other creatures on God's terms. Men, I have another important question to ask on this Father's Day. Have we accepted what God says is off limits to us? Have we accepted what God says is prohibited? Are we living on God's terms, within his parameters, under God's authority? Are we giving God our obedience? Have we accepted what God has said to be no? Men, there ought to be some no's in our lives. Why? Because God says it's not right. Because God says it's not moral. Because God says it's not holy. Because God says it's not Christ-like. Because God says it's not just. Because God says it's not legal. Because God says it's not honest. Because God says it's not truthful. Because God says it's not productive. Because God says it's not positive. Because God says it's not life-enhancing. There have to be some no's in our lives because God says we can't do everything and anything we think we're big and bad enough to do. There ought to be some no's in our lives. Lastly, in the making of a man, what we learn from Genesis chapter two is God bless man with a partner to help in his life.
Yes, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Let me help you understand what I'm talking about here because I don't want you to misunderstand what is being said here. The actual understanding here is that God made a partner for the man, a partner suitable for him. This partner was made to complement him, to work alongside him, to be his partner in life. The man was to see the new creature as the help he would need in his life, both helping each other to live up to God's best potential and highest expectations that he would have for the both of them. It says the Lord God made this partner from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Notice this partner was not born of the man. This helper was not the man's child, which would have given him authority over her. No, God formed this partner from the man's side. The, the old commentator by the name of Matthew Henry wants to lifefully put this understanding this way. The helper was not made out of the man's head to top him, not out of man's feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved by him. When Adam woke up from God's miraculous surgery, Adam expressed wonder and awe at finally having a partner and a helpmate. The man, Adam, was so excited over this new creation of God that one commentator said that he shouted out Whoa, man. <laughs> and God said, well, that's what we'll call her. Whoa, man. <laughs> now, God made man and whoa, man for each other. Jeremiah Wright said, men and women are called into a relationship characterized by mutuality reciprocity, and shared responsibility. Men, I, I'm, I'm sorry I've been bugging you with a lot of questions, but I have one last important question to ask. Who is our helper and partner in life? To be a man doesn't mean that we don't need anybody in life. To be a man doesn't mean that we can be all and do all by ourselves. To be a man means to also know we need a partner in life, a helper in life. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go out and marry our partners and our helpers. This is not, this is not saying we have to be married in order to be successful in life. No, we can have women who are sister friends and sister partners without benefits. We can have sister partners in life and it be purely platonic and not erotic. My question is, who is our booster seat in life, men? Booster seat? What are you talking about, Reverend? 
Another illustration, a father and a child went into a restaurant and were shown to their table by the hostess. And when the child sat in the chair at the table, he discovered that the table was too high and that the chair was too low. Realizing that something needed to be done, the boy looked at his father and said, Daddy, I need a booster seat. Why did he ask for a booster seat? Because the booster seat gave the boy the boost he needed to reach what he could not obtain. <laughs> Dr. Tony Evans said, God made the woman to be the helper because a man needs help. <laughs> if you're finding fault with your man, guess what your role is, woman? To help him get better. <laughs> That's not your sole purpose. No, please don't misunderstand women. That's not your sole purpose, but that is part of each other's purpose. To be each other's partner, men and women, in life. And to help each other get better. And to reach our highest potential. And to be all that God has in mind for both of us, men and women, to be. Which leads me to flip the script. I'm going to flip the script, women. And that is, I need to ask you a question. I've been asking the men all these questions. I have a question for you. Women, are you our booster or are you our basher? Ah, uh, it was Ron Elmore in his book, How to Love a Black Man. And in this book, he points out the difference between a male basher and a male booster. He says, first of all, he defines bashers as women who expect black men to be pitiful. You know, that old, or the old thing that is said, oh, all being are trifling, all being are dogs, all being are no good. He says that a, 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 a women bashers are women who expect black men to be pitiful and who take responsibility for pointing out their flaws to them and making them pay for them. Those, he said, are male bashers. But a booster is a woman who builds up men, helps us get better, who congratulates a brother they see is doing well, or at least trying to do his best. A, a, a woman booster is one who who help men and who know the difference between a man who is lazy and a man who is down on his luck struggling to get up. A woman who builds up men is a booster who knows that not all men are comfortable with their situation, but some men are facing challenges that are simply because and unique and specific to being a black man. In, in my reading, in my studies, I came across an interesting theory. There's this theory called John Henryism. John Henryism. Are you familiar with the legendary story of John Henry? John Henry. John Henry was a legendary story of a black man said to have worked as a steel driving man, a man who was tasked with hammering a steel drill into rock to make holes for explosives to blast the rock in constructing a railroad tunnel. The story goes that John Henry was an enormous man who worked on the Big Bend Tunnel near Talcott, West Virginia. His story symbolized the many African-American men who sweat and hard work 
built and maintained the rails across West Virginia. He was a symbol for the black worker. The black workers who gave their lives in this dangerous occupation of building railroad in tunnels. As the legend goes, John Henry's prowess as a steel driver was measured in a race against a steam-powered rock drilling machine. A race that he won only to die in victory with hammer in his hand as his heart gave out from stress. Though the legend celebrates John Henry's victory using determination and strength against seemingly insurmountable odds, John Henry's story holds another truth, and that is it was his stress that killed him. Sherman James, a social epidemiologist, spent four decades, an epidemiologist, I'm sorry, he spent four decades exploring why black men have higher rates of diseases like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, strokes due to stress. He, 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 he spent four decades, 40, 40 years studying why black men have such high rates in these diseases, which also led to shorter lifespans than all other Americans. He came up, Sherman James, came up with this theory called John Henryism, a contemporary social theory of a black man striving to get ahead in an unequal, unfair, and unjust society. He says the effort black men expend confronting his societal challenges day in and day out leads to stress so corrosive that it physically changes and damages their bodies. His conclusion is that the constant stress of striving to succeed in the face of social inequality and structural racism can cause lasting physical damage. Sherman James said that persistence, working twice as hard over time can really impair multiple physiological systems. It's this striving to make something of themselves, to live their lives with dignity and purpose, and to be successful against extraordinary circumstances that causes black men to age quicker, become sicker, and die younger than nearly any other U.S racial demographic group. Women, there are some men who feel like John Henry, who are under the constant stress of striving to get ahead, to make something of themselves, to live their lives with dignity, while against extraordinary circumstances from being a black man. Some men need your help because they are behind the eight ball, have fallen in between the widening health, criminal employment, education disparity gaps, and are being constantly disrespected and their actions always suspected. Some men just need a sister's help. Not bashed, but boosted. Not condemned, but forgiven. Not criticized, but motivated. Not discouraged, but encouraged. John Henry doesn't need added stress when he gets back to his home corner, but he needs to be refreshed. The Bible said the Lord God said it's not good for the man to be bashed. I mean, to be alone. I will make him a helper, a partner, I will make him a booster. 
Let me end this sermon on this Father's Day to all men. My brothers, on this Father's Day, I leave you with this. Remember what it truly means for us to be Adam, to be a man. It is to be dependent on God for our very lives. It is to stay connected to God who is our power, possibility, and potential source. It is to work our assignment, our ordained, our planned and purpose and destined assignment from God. It is to make a significant impact in God's world, in God's community, and in God's home. It is to live within God's parameters, to live based on what God says no because God says so. It is to have a God-given booster partner in life because God knows we cannot make it in this life all by ourselves. And if we are this type of man, then I come to let you know that regardless of our contemporary societal context or condition or circumstances and challenges, if I may use the words of Dr. Charles Gilchrist Adams, that retired prophet, preacher, pastor of Harford Memorial Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, if we live this type of manhood, regardless of our contemporary conditions and circumstances, and challenges in life. It can be done. We can do it. If there's a problem, we can solve it. If there's hatred, then we can shake it. If there's trouble, we can take it. If there's a mountain, we can climb it. If there's a battle, we can fight it. If there's prejudice, we can overcome it. If there's a cross, we can bear it. If there's a challenge, we can face it. And if we get knocked down, we can get up because we'll be living like God's man. Amen. Amen. And amen. Happy Father's Day. Let us pray. Most holy and all wise God, thank you for your word today. Crafted, made for us to hear it on this day. Thank you for how it has blessed men and women on this day. And I pray, O oh Lord, that wherever we are, having heard this word, that we will have a greater understanding of what it means to be a man, what it is to be made by your creative hands. Lord, I pray that we will continue to live based on this new understanding, this fresh understanding, that even in the midst of our challenges, even in the midst of our context and our circumstances, that being the man that you have made us to be will not stop us from being all that you have created us to be. I pray, O oh Lord, for a renewed dedication to living connected with you. Understanding, O oh God, we were created to be connected, to live our lives in relationship with you. So, Lord, I pray for anybody on this day of Father's Day, I pray for any man that they will make that new dedication, if not a rededication, to live according to the man that you have made them to be. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this opportunity to hear your word. And I pray for those who may not have given their life to you, committed to living for you, living based on how you have designed our lives to live. 
I pray, O oh God, that if there's anyone who wants to make that commitment today, that by your spirit, you will continue to call them and, Lord, invite them to this new way of living. And if there's anybody looking for a church home, I pray, O oh God, they will still consider Antioch, Missionary Baptist Church, as a community of believers to connect with. That even in this place that we're in right now, we can still make connections. We can still grow. We can still worship. We can still learn. We can still be what you called us to be in this body of Christ. I pray that they will make that decision today. Lord, as we bring this prayer to a close, we include in our prayer today strength, healing, help, blessings, forgiveness, love, and concern for the young and the old, the sick and the well, the joyful and the sorrowful, the rich and the poor, the housed and the homeless, the nourished and the hungry, the employed and the unemployed, those delivering and those dying. We include in this prayer the faithful and the faithless, those nearby in our neighborhoods and those far away in the world, we include in this prayer our leaders and volunteers, anybody and everybody in between. And we ask you to bless us according to your goodness, your grace, and your kindness, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you heard that I prayed for you. I prayed for you, and particularly those of you who have not given your life to this life of Jesus Christ. This new life, this new way of living according to his will, his way, and his word. And perhaps you would like to give your life to learning, to being committed, to giving it an all-out try, to live according to the way Jesus Christ calls us to live. Or perhaps you're looking for a church home. Again, look, we're connecting right now. God has given us tools and means, Zoom and Facebook and YouTube and emails and texts and just so many tools and ways to connect with you wherever you are. So you can be a member of our church. If you're interested, to give your life to Christ or become a member of our church, we invite you to go to Antioch's website and submit the discipleship form. Go to AntiochFamily.org and there you will find a, 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 a discipleship form and you can fill it out and submit it and uh, we will receive that information and get back with you. Or you can send us an email by clicking the send email button on Antioch's Facebook page and someone will soon get in touch to celebrate with you your decision and give you further instructions on what to do. It's been a joy to share this word with you and I do pray and hope that uh, you were blessed today, men and women. Pray that all who tune in today were blessed today. Please share uh, this Facebook page uh, with others and invite them to look at it again. We have it in our archives on our YouTube page. We invite you to continue to worship with us. On next Sunday, I will pick up uh, in the series of sermons that I'm preaching on Peter's famous speeches. We will continue that series as we look at what I call his famous speeches as recorded in the book of Acts. There are eight of them. And uh, we're going to begin uh, to look at the fourth of his speeches on next Sunday. May God continue to bless you. Again, happy Father's Day. I hope you have an enjoyable day. God bless you. Thank you. Now to him who's able to keep us from falling, present you falling for the master receiving great joy. To the all-wise God be glory, power, dominion now, hence, forevermore. And we all say, Amen.